Welcome. On behalf of the Berkshire Festival of Women Writers, we are very excited for this event, which has um, kind of become a signature event of the festival since Kupa has been around. Um, it was a wonderful, really memorable event last year, and I know some people in the audience are back this year because they remember how wonderful it was last year. So um, we're really excited for this. And I just want to remind everybody that this is the beginning of week two at the Berkshire Festival of Women Writers. There are, there are three weeks worth of um, wonderful events like this all over the county. So um, I hope you will come to some more of them. Um, we had a great time International Women's Day yesterday. And on and on. We won't stop till the end of March. So I'm here to introduce Kukwa, our host tonight. Kukwa Yomefe is a native of Ghana. She characterizes herself as a transdisciplinary artist. She choreographs West African dance forms, cooks the fusion of Ghanaian dishes, and pens memoirs, essays, and social commentaries. Her scholarly and writing interests lie at the intersection of race and skin color, African culture, black women's bodies, expression of voice, and nonconformance, and performativity. All of her work is influenced by her education and socialization in womanist, feminist, and Africanist theories. She's the author of several essays and prose poems. Some of her essays have been anthologized in African Women Writing Resistance, yes. which I saw a copy of. I just put it away. <laughs> I just want to wave this in front of you. African Women Writing Resistance, which um, I co-edited with another Simon Strack alum, Tayo Jo Laosho, and... Um, Pauline Dongala, who some of you may know, and um, another scholar of African literature. And um, that's how Kukla and I met. And that is how she came to Simon's Rock, in fact. Um, <laughs> she would have also had um, work published in Becoming Bi, Bisexual Voices from Around the World, and Inside Your Ear. Her essay, The Audacity to Remain Single, Single Black Women in the Black Church, is anthologized in queer religion too. She writes a blog, the name of which I'm blanking on. <laughs> and, um, and she also um, has a essay forthcoming in Writing Fire, which is the festival anthology that will be published in a couple weeks. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Kukwa Yu. Welcome. Um, thank you, Jenny. It's good to be here. Be alive to see this winter almost over. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I've written my introduction for so many days now and I gave up. So here, here's what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> it's been a month. We've been working really hard. Um, what um, I think the one thing I want to convey is the women and I do want, want to encourage you to keep sympathy at bay, as far away from this room as possible. Okay? So the stories you're going to hear are quite deep. The first half is, is pretty intense, so here's your um, hashtag trigger warning right now, um, <laughs> because these are real stories, and they're real life happenings for, for most of us. Um, so it's going to be heavy for the first half and then we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to try and lighten it up a little bit. Um, but I don't need, I need you to, to hold that sympathy somewhere else. I need you to appreciate the, the skill of putting words to paper to actually make it viable, to make it poetry, to make it creative nonfiction. Um, I need you to appreciate the bravery to invite you into a space that's so intimate for most of us. Um, and I think above all, I just need you to appreciate them just like you would any other writer, regardless of skin color or identity. Okay? So just sort of keep all the other, oh, poor child, oh, poor brown kid, or, you know, whatever else is, is trying to nod back of your head or wants to come up and say, Oh, these poor children, God have mercy. No, <laughs> keep it out there. Leave it out there. Okay, so I want you to enjoy what we prepared for you. 
Um, I want you to also realize that the story is not, it's unique to, to, to us individually, but it's not unique as, as our like, sort of individual stories. It's pain and love and you know, all of that is, is a universal. And so that's where I want you to tap into. Tap into that place where it's like, I remember that myself, you know. So tap into that. Um, so I will open. This is a piece I got published last year. I'm very excited about. Um, it's called S36. I turned 36 today. I spent the day in the ocean. When I came in to rinse off the sand, I paused in front of the mirror. I looked in the mirror and I saw myself as you see me. Really saw myself. A head that once went bald now sports baby locks. Black hair with a hint of burgundy color. Attempting to defy my Rasta hating folks. Forehead sprinkled with heat rashes. It's been unbearably hot lately. Bushy eyebrows that frame piercing brown eyes doing the looking. I pause. I ought to go thread those eyebrows. I check myself. That's not why I'm in the mirror. Eyelashes that put most mascara enhanced and fake ones to shame. High cheekbones creating the contours for those cheeks that I have now filled out nicely since I put on some white. Nose that hints of my European heritage. That's how they say I'm mixed. At least that's what the family elders say. They say I didn't pick the color or the hair, but the nose. They say they can claim me with that. <laughs> Lips that are full and undoctored, shyly cover teeth ridicule for life. Piranha, rabbit. Lips that are succulent to kiss, or so I've been told. Neck long and regal, holding up my head. Rings tenderly encircling it. <clears throat> Nefertiti hunks down to my chest. My collarbones, they used to protrude so much more. They've also filled in a bit since I put on weight. Today, when I looked in the mirror, I saw myself as you see me. Perky size B, left side, and size A, right side, breast, <laughs> usually nestle in C cups because I can't be honest with the world. Shoulders broad and set, slightly curved, arms that look stick-like to me still, no matter how much I eat. I've always wanted to be fat. Maybe thick is a better word. They used to tease me mercilessly. Bag of bones. Skinny male. I can never please this society. One day I'm 80 pounds and they say I'm sick. And now years later, I'm 160 and they say I'm fat. What's the just right mark? I look up from washing my face and for the first time I smile. Really smile at the woman in the mirror who turned 36 today. She looks nothing like her age. People say she's kidding. My eyes travel again. I see a hip waist proportion I'm doubtful of. I wish my belly was flatter. I have a fear of becoming disproportional, having a big <laughs> stomach. But then again, I know I'm well fed. Plus, there's nothing a bit of toning won't do, I think. I turn and I admire, you know, the big booty. I hear, I often hear others mention some smack, some squeeze, some enviably make comments. The capital S back that accentuates the booty even more. My hips have gotten wider with the weight gain. I set my hands on them. I'm pleased they've gotten wider. I like them this way. You like them this way. My knees are too dark. My knees and my elbows are in cahoots, I'm convinced, to get me kicked out of this mixed family. 
<laughs> Maybe I ought to keep them covered more. But my legs, yeah, my legs, I like them just fine. I've got calves that rival most. They say I got that from my mama. Ankles that narrow just right to support. My feet are okay, but they are dark too. They and my hands have been models for catalogs, so I know they are right. Especially when they have some red nail polish on them. <laughs> I look at her, stare at her deep in the eyes. I step away from the mirror. I turned 36 today, and I finally see me the way you see me. So, the other young women are going to go in the following order for the first half. Carla Martinez with Resurrection, Sarah Abubakha, <coughs> I'm still calling it hair. Okay, you can do that, <laughs> I don't really have a title for it. So. With hair. Brianna Pope with Ribs, Naomi Camp, Naomi Campbell, <laughs> <laughs> Naomi Harris with Skin, and Sarah again with Zura. Welcome the ladies. <coughs> So as Kukwa said, this is called Resurrection, and I sort of want to preface this briefly by saying that I don't think that I'm God. <laughs> It'll make sense in a minute, I promise. <clears throat> the chapel candles flicker. Smoke dances if you look closely. The flames sometimes drown in wax. I am hosting a candlelight vigil for the girl I used to be, the one who was ashamed of her last name. The white boys taunted me, told me that I must be good at climbing fences. I have scars from chain link and barbed wire. My hands bleed from paper cuts of citizenship. The white boys ask me why my people deserve to be here, and I remind them of the bones they stand on. I show them reasons that are buried in fields of sugar cane, hidden under railroads that cross America. A nation that kicks dirt in my face and says that we are the same shade of brown. But tonight, that girl who felt like dirt is being laid to rest. The Mexican church says that a piece of God is inside of you, and the white boys take it literally, and ask me about how good I am at crossing borders. And I tell them that the borders I have crossed you can't overcome just by walking. I conquer those borders by pulling myself out of the dirt, of constructing a backbone made of shrapnel, of believing that I have a piece of God inside of me. I do not believe in God as an entity, I believe in God as actions. Being God is not demonizing the brown inside of me, it is learning how to love every part of myself. Being God is being a stained glass window, beautiful in my colored imperfection. Being God is giving light. So tonight, I take the chapel candle and lay roses on the grave of the girl who thought that being brown meant being less. Tonight I am a stained glass window, giving colored brightness, burning. The peace of God in me sparks, a dark smoldering ember in a white winter. As they raise the headstone, the peace of God in me is resurrected. like a fridge so we kept our bodies close. I was going through the pictures he had taken as my heartbeat tried to compete with the roar of trucks moving heaps of ice and snow off the road. As the truck moved towards us, I leaned in closer to him. I stifled a sigh to the curve of his shoulder blade. Before I even start to say anything, he reminds me of all the love my body craves underneath the shame. He says the hairs around my nipples are his favorite as he coils a particularly long one around his finger. I remember the first day of gym, having to change in front of the girls I had been in school with for ages. I remember Alex Garcia, my best friend, turning me and saying, you should really ask your mom to let you shave. It must be embarrassing to wear gym shorts with all that hair everywhere. 
It was. I was in the sixth grade when I first asked my mom if I could shave. My mom said no to shaving, but she let me wax my legs instead. I should have known it was a trap. The moment the hot wax crossed my leg, all excitement disappeared. Is this what it took? Suddenly having a little hair on my legs didn't seem to matter too much. Then again, I started to think, maybe this is the price I'll have to pay. That blank logic helped ease the sacrifices of assimilation. My legs were red, rashed, smooth, and beautiful. Sooner rather than later, they would be red, rashed, and stubbly. I remember Mariah laughing at my leg hairs bleached to light blonde after the painful waxing experience I didn't want to repeat. My obsession with purifying my body didn't end with my legs. <clears throat> I used to always go to homeroom early in the seventh grade, especially because Wesley and Josh would always get there at least 20 minutes early. I remember the silence that followed a joke about my mustache. I didn't have much to say. Brigitte got her eyebrows done, and I thought I should do the same, because as soon as she had two eyebrows instead of one, she made a lot of new friends. <laughs> the lady at the salon asked how I would want them. She didn't take off enough. I remember when I shaved my arm and my mom slapped me, because now they would never grow in right. Some of my arm hairs don't lie down on my arm now. Some are darker than others, and none of them seem to agree where they're going. <laughs> I left high school, I left home, I adopted a closet of crop top, mini skirts, and flip flops. First I removed all the parts that were too loud to show, leg hair, arm hair, my happy trail, the small hairs underneath the knuckles and my toes. He took off my underwear and I apologized for the hair growing in. He asked why and I shrugged. With the smooth glistening skin he wore, I figured I should apologize for what has always offended others like him. I will read ribs. Um, let's take it from you to give to me. I can count your ribs, he said, as his fingers ran lightly over bony ridges. They dipped in and out of her side. How many are there? You want me to count your ribs? Yeah. No, I'm not going to count them. Say ribs again. Ribs. Mm -hmm. I'm hungry. <laughs> You're starving, he deadpanned. She grinned. Why are you smiling? The grinned your brother. Seriously, stop it. So serious today. Her lips quickly contracted over the gleam of slightly gray, yet perfect teeth. Are you fucking kidding me? No, you're being really serious. Kind of putting a damper on my mood. He stood up. Plastic the plastic chair screeched along the tile. I'm putting a damper on your mood. He sounded surprised, as if it were completely inconceivable, as if the entire time he had only been part of the solution, not the problem. Yes, you are. It's like, I didn't ask you to come in here with your black cloud. You're selfish. I am, she agreed. I hate you. Well, that's a terrible thing to say to me right now, but that's fine, because I hate me too. I hate you. What? I hate... <coughs> she stopped. He stopped. The vein in his forehead pulsed a vibrant blue. She let out a giggle. Tears swelled in his eyes. Why is this funny? She shrugged. That vein, I just... I always want to poke it. <laughs> you can't poke my vein. A small bony finger reached out, E.T. bone home style. Frustration made him sit again so close that her finger almost succeeded in reaching the bulge that was still slightly inflated with blood. He resisted the urge to smack her hand away. Instead, he took a deep breath to be, to be reminded that he had to be gentle with her. It was times like these, times when she was in a joking mood, that he had to be reminded the most. He couldn't relax enough just to enjoy the sound of her laugh. There was some guilt that tinged at his heart, but he thought his lack of humor was appropriate. What if touching your vein is my last request? Then can I touch it? No. Mm. But I'm dying. I want to touch it. Her full bottom lip stuck out. It was vaguely blue. <clears throat> Her skeleton body was tinged with blue. You are dying. Stop that. Come on, Jason. Look at me. He had been, in fact, looking directly into her eyes the moment she said that. Unable to handle the sudden reality of the flatness, he looked at the floor. His 
spotless, with clean grout lines. A faded flower adorned each tile, some with leaves that stretched out to meet other, meet other flowers, some solitary, preferring to stay within the single square. His eyes met hers again. Hers, a green so vibrant, but no one could tell anymore because they had sunk far back into her skull. She had soft skin like a baby, except now she had sprouted sparse tufts of springy dark hair all over it. And there she was, propped up against the pillows, barely making an indent. She was so small that under the covers, it was hard to believe that she had legs and an abdomen and a skull. Really, she appeared to only have a large, overwhelming skull, just barely covered with taunt grayish bluish skin. In that moment, Jason felt tempted to call his girlfriend beautiful, but that would have been a lie that she would have greatly appreciated. If he called her beautiful, which her personality still was, she would think that she was fine, and it was fine, and that what she was doing to him was fine. But it wasn't. And it had taken him the majority of the relationship to realize that someone could love another person and be given love two times back and still be sick. Because up until the very moment that, she had, that he had stopped thinking about what she was doing to him, he had to realize what she was doing to herself. He had to realize that the pain he felt could be nothing like the pain she felt. He was only getting a bitter taste, but her body was literally wasting away because she was unable to believe the compliments he gave her when she was beautiful, unable to look in the mirror and see the truth with her own eyes. It was only here, only now she lay crumpled, under, crumpled in slight under starch white sheets that she felt perfect. When she caught glimpses of herself in reflective surfaces, <clears throat> she would smile and touch her overly prominent cheekbones. In private, Jason had requested only classic utensils, and the mirror had suddenly been taken down because it required maintenance. Only sometimes did she ask to see a reflection. Perfection can only get worse, never better. There was a soft beeping noise in the background, but it didn't annoy him. It was the only thing that made him believe that Sarah was alive. He stood up again. You're leaving? Sarah was half asleep, mumbling. Jason briefly considered it. She didn't bother to fight to keep her eyelids open, partly because she had a finite supply of energy, but mostly because so many people, people forced by genetics to love her unconditionally, had left her. Sick of the pain she continued to judge them through. Pain they considered to be optional. No baby, I'm not leaving. He hadn't left her bedside since he rushed her to it, and the realization triggered a wave of weariness to creep through him. His mind felt the creakiness of her bones. A nurse came in to quickly replace the depleted bag and to leave fresh sheets on the back of his chair. She was the only one on Sarah's nursing staff that remained firm in her belief of recovery. The only one who knew when Sarah's plate was empty that he didn't eat it for her. She was also the only one who continued to bring a cot to place next to Sarah's bed, even though his place would always be in Sarah's bed. And the look she gave to Jason proved that she expected to see the, ma to see the emaciated chest of Sarah still rising and the nurse squeezed his shoulder. The heat transferred from her fingers left soon as the door clicked close. Sarah stole the warmth out of him whenever she touched him. Each night his resolve to sleep in the cot would stay strong for five minutes before either climbing in with her or being asked to get in with her. And Sarah had not been particularly fond of cuddling, but his body against her seemed to be necessary now. She was always so cold, so that if he pressed his fingertips into her inner wrist, he would not be able to feel her blood flowing freely. Jason would always get this horrifying image of the inside of her body being filled with tepid blood, and even when he lay with her, pressed to his skin, his palm flat against the underside of her left breast, he would lay rigid and unmoving, unsure of whether or not the, her heart was still beating. And the slight rise of her, che his, her chest would scare him into thinking that it was just her soulless body floating as a released carbon dioxide necessary only for life outside of herself. I love you. Sarah didn't respond. He climbed into her bed and gingerly tucked her into the contours of his body. I'm sorry. I love you, he repeated. The beeping went on. Thank you. Really?
Uh, this piece is called On My Body, A Story You Can Read. <coughs> when I was younger, I had the softest skin. There was not a single blemish on my arms. But over time, the tally marks started to appear. Two, four, six, eight. Only in even numbers did my skin break. Weeks turned into months, then months into years. The smooth skin became a road marked by pain, with more cracks in it than a New York City sidewalk. Razors were hidden by false smiles, and reassurance and sleeves soaked up any evidence of anguish. I'm fine. The words that became my emotional default response. It was all I could say, all I would say. And no one saw, so no one knew. Some days it's so easy to clean your wounds, cry a little, or a lot. And then force a smile on your face and act like everything's okay. But it's not. There's so much to say, but no one to tell. The tally marks will increase, but it's alright. Everything's alright, because I'm fine. But am I? People say the world is beautiful, but it's also cruel. Its cruelty taints us all, and yet most are unaffected by it. And then there are those like us, who notice it all too well, and so we try to claw it out of our skin, out of our souls. These markings serve as evidence of our struggles, of our attempts to free ourselves to no avail, and in doing so, we have become monsters. Ostracized by society because we dared to fight back. But we lost. Razors dull and rust with blood, and all you have is a prayer that next time you'll cut deep enough. What's the point in hoping things will get better when alcohol can't numb the sadness and a blade can't replace a smile? Can anyone coax the blade from your fingertips with the promise of a better tomorrow? Can anyone get you off the ledge with whispers of sweet nothings about the beauty in the world that you have yet to see? Are we monsters or merely lost souls? Perhaps the monsters are just beings who never had their stories told. Who knows? Maybe I'll ask them. After all, there's a union that can be found in monstrosity. One simply has to dare to look. Letter to the audience. Letter to the audience. I do not want to show you. To take off my clothes, peel my skin and muscle from the bone, hand it to you for the pleasure of your examination. You do it all the time. Anyway, I do not care for you. I do not create for you. I do not care for you. I do not, not, I do. Heard my father's voice through the telephone last night. 9.50 p.m. He said, wow, you made it through. The day is done. I said the day is infinite. This moment belongs to the afterlife to say, wow, you made it through. You moved through it. You made through it. Before the call in the bathroom, I let the sink water run. Like I, I let my body fall under the sink like I followed the water into the drain and finally asked myself why I ever thought I could escape. That's how I know I'm insane. First, I left Florida to go north. It didn't work. It still has me. Now I have plans to transfer my body out into the city, out into another middle of nowhere, or out of the school system, or out of my very breath. I haven't decided yet, but none of it will work, I know, because I've done it, done it, done it, done it, done it before. I'm creating destinations to move to and away from and when I arrive I know and feel the doom like knowing behind the shower curtain is a nude murderer and when you pull back the curtain you find that it's your body wet and coming at you like uncovering the dish on the table to see that the head is yours that the people seated at the table are not your family but melanin deficient strangers drooling for you hungry for your black flesh to put you on to put your for your black to be chewed and broken down inside their bodies like you knew it all along though you woke up tasting that moment on your tongue knowing you couldn't wash it out you woke up skin and mind born into and in a doom you born into a quiet fear of tragedy. That's how I know I am, because I keep trying to run after a shadow, chasing a spirit of happiness. I keep trying to find ways to stop trying, gasping for the starting line, falling into the finish, and if really what you're looking for is inside you, then it's true. I knew it all along. 
I keep trying to find it, and after searching in the bottom of my organs for so long, I see the spirit is not there. I see me chasing a spirit I fathom for the act of chasing. I see me creating hope, because the only way I can stay alive is if I'm running. I see me, I see me, I see, I, I. Letter to the audience. I have done it anyway, but if I didn't, naturally, you would have done the honors. Thank you. Am I a whore for losing my virginity to rape as a Muslim American? We argued about Dad always saying it would only take six months. You look so much better now, he professes to the pack car, glancing at me in the rear view mirror. His green eyes were bright in a way that made me sympathetic. He didn't understand. But still, I grew hot, living at the ra rational time stamp placed on my recovery. He didn't understand. Oh, it would only be six more months before I could be someone else. Someone different from the girl crying and screaming in her bed at two in the morning. Dad eventually stopped yelling at me and instead at my mom for pressuring me the way she does, for making me depressed. She sat quietly as I carried the, the glass of water to my hand, shaking at its weight. Now she sat sat in the car smiling at Dad's prognosis. When they found my rolling papers that night, Mom asked me to prove myself, so I asked Sohei for a clean bottle of urine. Mom knew better and followed me into the bathroom. As I thought of the hundred lies I could tell her, both new and old, the X next to the marijuana box grew more prominent, breaking through the silence with its inexcusable presence. Dad began to wonder, wonder what he did wrong. How could I even be sitting before him? Mom began, began to shake. I pleaded, promising I wasn't that bad. Dad said I could never go back to college. He wouldn't pay for it. After minutes of begging, he said I could win back his trust if he knew I wasn't soiled. The next day, my mom took me for a virginity test. To answer your disbelief, of course those don't exist. Well, not in America, anyways. But in Pakistan, where my parents come from, it's a common practice, most often used to defend or dispel a woman's honor. My doctor, being the angel she is, understand what, understood what I needed wasn't God, but a chance out of my house. She told my mom everything she wanted to hear. Still, my boyfriend and I worried that it wouldn't be enough to persuade my parents to let me free. We thought of ways I could free myself. I still wanted to go to Simon's Rock. I've learned more here than I could ever imagine knowing. I've cared more here than I could ever imagine caring. To be able to pay for school myself, however, wouldn't be easy. I could have emancipated myself in order to receive financial aid that reflects my status as an independent, broke 17-year-old high school dropout, but, <laughs> but my sophomore year of college was start starting soon. There wouldn't be enough time for a trial. He asked me to marry him. If my parents knew about him, I wouldn't be here now. They wouldn't care that he's the smartest person I know, or that he's the first person to be so encouraging in me to figure out who I am or what I want to be. He wasn't Muslim, he's white, so he wasn't for me, and I can't have him. When I came back, when I came back home the next time, I was an adult. I was 18 and still held my tongue. I didn't wear shorts in the house, even though the Quran says it's okay. My dad said it made him uncomfortable to see me like that. I'm a woman, and I should dress like it. I didn't tell my sisters that it was wrong to call Fatma a slut for having a child at my age, even if she was Muslim, thinking to myself it was more a brave reality than I could face even a year ago when I stuck off to Planned Parenthood alone. I didn't tell my mom when I was sad, and I didn't tell my dad how it hurt to have an expiration date to put on my depression. When my mom told me to pray the devil away, I washed myself, fastened my scarf, and followed the movements to survive, limited to the four mere surahs I knew. I didn't recite them, though. I simply contorted my body to impress, and my mind grasped on onto the hope of freedom. I used to think that meant turning 18. <laughs> um, and then there is a poem that goes with this that I would like to also want. <gasps> so. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, I want to kill myself. Feet curled at the sound of footsteps, and I only know four ways to keep this going. Looking down, strands of a soft purple masila caress my feet. Calm down, don't let them know. Allah Akbar. 
God is right, hands to my shaking knees. Spawner up Elysium, spawner up Elysium, spawner up Elysium. Trembling at the weight of my body, lust is wrong, love is wrong. Lying close to death, I push myself to the ground. Pull my roots from the grounds of hell, throw me into the heaven, I don't think I'll make it. Let me crash against the gate and soar through the sky in all my pieces, bright, brilliant, and bold against gray clouded skies, fireworks on my own independence day. Assalamu alaikum Sorry, we have to go, go through this crap. Oh, and she doesn't know, right? No one told her. She won't know. I was just sitting behind the wall of my parents' parents' bedroom, reading a book, enjoying the 15-year-old sunshine, and picking up on their conversation. The deafening hum poured into me, from head to toe, shaking everything in my young little world. I was in denial, but the truth was clear. Mom let go of a baby. An entity I hate so much, but also love so dearly. A month earlier, on my 15th birthday, Mom and Dad sung happy birthday to me, ate the cake, and then started joking around as if they suddenly sharing back to a pair of teens. What do you say we have a little brother or sister for you? We four can team up and play computer games. Isn't that fun? They laughed hysterically, drumming the table. What's so funny? What the hell are both of you thinking? Have another baby? You must be completely out of, out of, out of your crazy minds. <laughs> I shrieked. I was extremely infuriated. If you really get a baby, you should prevent me from strangling you. <laughs> Throwing those malicious words right in your faces, I walked away and slammed the door. I didn't know mom was pregnant. For years, I've been dreaming that I would have little brothers or sisters. I would spend entire days telling them funny stories about when I was at their ages. I would, when they were old enough, take them on a world trip using my own money and tell them how good it feels to rack up frequent flyer miles. <laughs> I would tell them about my life as an international student out of the rooster-shaped land. I would stress to them how important mom and dad are to us and how much you need to do to take good care of them. But it's also common sense that with over 1.5 billion people and very limited resources, my country cannot afford ongoing population growth. The government even issued the strict one-child policy. Hmm. For years, we have been resigned from our politics textbook. Once you have a second child, you will have to pay a large fine and you may lose your job because you failed the policy. Even if you survive the fine and the job loss, the shocking cost of living will put you through another ongoing struggle. Mom was 44, Dad was 48. They had been working so hard just to raise me one child alone. And I was about to study abroad. How could they spare more money and energy to raise another child, another being who needed wholehearted attention around the clock? Now that a dream is gone, because reality is far too harsh for dreams to ever exist. It's been almost three years. Mom and Dad never found out that I knew about a pregnancy. Now, I have to bear the secret forever and take all of these myself. Here I am, the only child of the family, claiming everything as mine. The 15-year-old me enjoying the 15-year-old sunshine while indirectly depriving another life from its rights to enjoy everything I am enjoying right now. However, it was the unfortunate that made me who I became right now, a 17-year-old woman fully aware of what it takes to live. I have nothing and no one to blame but myself. 
So I stared into the sun, swore to myself that I would live a wonderful life for the unlived. Here at Simon's Rock, though everything is hard, I'm fortunate to have so many lovely friends and faculty around. I'm very hopeful for a bright, colorful future life ahead. But something bugs me, invisibly prickling me for months. Let me ask you this. When you hear people saying the word Asian, what would you think of? Faces as flat as shoe bottoms? <laughs> Yellowish skin poked market with acne spots? Hard workers with little spirit for fun? Chief swallowers silent as plain rocks? Or vicious businessmen toying with abacuses for nights? You might be saying, um, this image is might seem pretty bad. But what if I tell you this are to some extent all true? We are all intrinsically flawed, though no one might see it that way. China, as the most populated nation on earth, keeps her modest path along her blooming development. But as an ordinary citizen, I myself have been self-content for all my previous 16 years of life believing that we were the majority on this planet. Everybody's learning Mandarin, and maybe one day, China as well as Asia will become the second superpower and lead people into a brand new stage of development. It took me so long until I was actually here, feet on the ground across the Pacific, to realize that though we Asians represent almost 40% of the world population, are still in the minority. We are still being discriminated against because we come from that mysterious land of the East. Because we have a skin color that is so close to that of the Earth which we are building the entire world upon right now. Or maybe because we bear our pain and emotions inside of ourselves rather than talking. Or because some of us are female Asians, stereotypically a most submissive group. I'm lucky. I'm one of the silent Asians. I haven't been overtly discriminated against or mistreated. But out of the comfort zone of the familiar lilt of native dialect, what are we? When we talk, do people care? Do they care about the predecessors trying to step out and state our opinions? I mean, the situation is not as bad as it used to be, but what we achieve now is not enough. Representative statements are powerful, but they're not strong enough to form our own uniform voice. During my life as an Asian woman here in the States, the somewhat awful jokes and stereotypes I've been hearing from my non-Asian friends make me more and more urged to speak up about them. My friends always ask me, why are you so good at math? Math must be in your genes. Oh no, math is in Asian genes. I mean, there are plenty of non-Asian mathematicians out there making remarkable contribution to mankind. Even if most of the Asians really are good at math, that is because they work hard. I do not see any problem with that. One of my best friends usually makes fun of Chinese people eating dogs. Eating dogs was a thing for us 60 years ago due to extreme poverty. But that's not the case anymore. The elderly may still maintain their habit, just like some extremists are still against the minority groups. They just can't help. Okay. Yeah. Here, I was not. I am not. And I will not accuse anyone. Today I'm here just to state my own thoughts. I'm here because I know who we are as Asians. The answer is plain and simple. We're humans. We are gifted with the ability to speak. Why should we hide our voice and keep ourselves suffering from our own silence? I am now aware that silence should not be an Asian thing, and I am so ready to show the people around me that Asians are not plain rocks. We have feelings and we are not afraid to show them, at least for me. I have the courage to speak out and I am not afraid to shout. I am ready, and I hope the world can and will listen. called, uh, is it about who you love or who they loved? He's staring at me. I squirm because it's too intense. Foggy green eyes born to the depths of my soul. 
I look away, not quite ready to let him see the things lurking beneath the liquid's bowl of brown that ring my pupils. I don't have to wonder what he sees when he looks at me. He tells me often enough. I believe him, but there is more that maybe he doesn't fully realize, and it's not just that he thinks, thinks I'm insanely beautiful. It's my potential. This is, if I had to bet, more attractive than my physical features. I don't know what it is that makes staring so uncomfortable. When we speak to someone, we're supposed to look them in the eyes. But we need to blink often, we need to look away in order to get those breaks. What's being taken from me when he's looking into the infinite depths of blackness? What is he doing when he stares past the point of awkwardness, and why does it not matter that I don't like it? It's easy for me to make the changes in my personality when I'm with someone. I can create whatever version of me you need. When there's those, those bias to fill out in about me section, I like to just put progressing. <laughs> I am. Am I? I've been with him my entire adult life. I think about that a lot. I think about progressing. So am I, you, or me? I've moved beyond childhood, but still linger at the threshold, one foot reaching, holding the door from slamming. Sometimes I feel like a grown-up in a grown-up relationship, while other times I feel like I need to chill out. I need to stop. But I'm a commitment addict. I crave attention. I crave unconditional love. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me! Love, love, lust, love, 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 lust, love. Attention, 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 affection, 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 give me love, love, lust, attention, affection, give me, give me, give me, give me, love, love, attention, 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 affection, 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 love. I can give you all of me if I can have all of you. Hell, maybe I don't even need all of you. But that's dangerous, isn't it? Loving that hard, loving that much, getting lost in the feeling and the love and the emotions and the promises and the touch. Oh, God, your touch and everything that ever that other person wants you to be. No, needs you to be. And being everything that person, being that person that you would die for. No, live for. When you look at me, who do you see? Is it the reflection of you pictured in the glassy effect of my eyes or in the glow of my skin? Or are you looking into the crevices of my soul, uncovering the secrets I try to smother and still imagining the person you want me to be? You say that I am your dream, girl. But how could I be that when I have never been able to discover what creeps behind the walls of your unconscious, behind the thorny barriers of your subconscious? How could that be when you yourself told me that you don't dream? I lack imagination, you say. Does that mean I am everything that I want to be? Or everything you want me to be? Am I real, or am I a mirage that you want to get lost in? Could it be that I am your oasis? Could it be that you are mine? Are you seeking temporary refuge when you sink inside me? When I touch your face, I imagine your skin rippling out like water on a calm night. My index finger trails down the bridge of your nose, one single disturbance falling into the pool. Blood is pulsing fast and hot in my ears, but when my hand reaches your chest, your heart beats slow. And, and sure, I don't know. I know, I don't know, but you reach out and go to the back of my head, and holding on to my hair by the root, my head falls back slightly at the command of your touch. And I'm real, you realize, as the pads of your fingertips sink into the firm tension of my skin, but also I am whole. I reach out, but not for you, for me. Thank you. She had it tattooed on her body. Tattoo number one, a musical note on her shoulder that was formed to make a heart. 
Not the first mark that she made on her skin, but the first, I think, that she considered to be beautiful. Hunger had interrupted our horror film fest, and so Fright Night was paused for the sake of snack. As I followed her to the kitchen, it caught my attention, a musical note to match the music in her soul. I always wondered, whenever I saw it, if it had hurt much when she got it done, if she trembled with excitement while sitting in that tattoo artist's chair, if she felt somehow liberated or rebellious or badass. Maybe I should ask her about it sometime. Tattoo number two. A rose in black ink on her hip, snuggled up closely to three buds yet to bloom. Such an intimate placement for a beautiful design. It was the final performance for In the Heights at our old high school. As she leaned over slightly to place her coat on the auditorium chair, the hem of her shirt lifted up as though a curtain were being raised, and the rose made its grand appearance in front of an audience of one, me. <laughs> Sometimes I would like to reach out and stroke that rose to coax the buds to bloom. I imagine placing my lips upon the musical note as I wrap my arms around her in a lover's caress. A thank you to the music that is her body which makes my heart sing. That one day we would go out and get matching tattoos together, holding each other's hands tightly as we are marked with a permanent symbol of our love. But I don't think her girlfriend would approve. <laughs> you see, she already has someone to stroke her tattoos and kiss them lovingly and hold her in a lover's embrace. I wonder if her girlfriend can coax the rosebuds and get them, get them to bloom. If their love is as strong and melodious as that musical note. If she can make her heart sing. Maybe I should ask them sometime. Maybe not. Maybe I'll just get a tattoo. Though no ink needle could ever mark me as deeply as her smile has marked my soul. But there's a first time for everything. This is a piece that, um... So, coming out is a con continual process, um, but this is the first piece that sort of put me on the map about 10, 10, 12 years ago. It's called Becoming By the First Time. So anyway, it's been building up since June, since I told her, after her graduation party, that I told this dude that I'd been seeing after having sex with him, then I wanted to kiss her. <laughs> Not the reaction the poor bloke was wanting after sex. <laughs> so that was June, July, August, September, September 21st. I guess that's not so long. But we have talked and laughed and joked about it. All the while I have gotten slowly attracted to her. We had already increased intensity and frequency of our lover, girlfriend, wife, terms of endearment that we usually threw back and forth at each other. So it only seemed a natural progression. I paid her a visit in her new place in Akron, Ohio. We got dressed and went out to dinner. A restaurant called, quite appropriately, The Two Amigos. <laughs> a Spanish-style restaurant operated by Get this, two gay guys <laughs> in a part of town that was LGBT friendly. <laughs> so it figures that the two of us would be having dinner there on such a rather auspicious day. A friend of one of her sisters recognized her, and much later in the night we got a text from her sister asking if she herself was so inclined. Of course, prefacing it with, not that it matters if you are, but <laughs> maybe that friend of her sister's could not imagine that a biracial friendship could not be anything but one imbued with sentiments of sexual tension. Oh, but never mind her sister. Ooh, was she the perfect date. She got my doors, my chairs, and the tap. <laughs> Feeding her a piece of my dinner must have confirmed it for anyone who was anxious to ascertain whether ours was pure friendship, untouched by racial attitudes, or a budding love match, created by Cupid herself. We spend the rest of the evening at Jillian, and then in front of the proverbial tube, watching Kissing Jessica Stein. Looking back now, I think, what a movie choice. <laughs> 
After the movie, we remained cuddling on the futon until the wee hours of the morning. When my propensity for sleep and comfort, winning the battle over my hormones, pushed me to crawl into the real bed. All during the movie, we would pause and have deep discussions about the implications of a potential match, of ever messing around, and what this would do to our amazing friendship. I managed to catch about four hours of sleep before she roused and came into the room, joining me in the bed. And there we lay, catching up on each other's past. Mine of boarding school experiences and escapades. Hers of growing up in white Midwest Ohio suburbia. Sharing fantasies and hopes that not too long ago were part of our deepest reservoirs of secrets. Breakfast cooked and eaten leisurely in bed interspersed our whole day. Building a suspense even more, we lay cuddling and joking about breast sizes, colors, and such. Suspense at its highest, I leaned in and kissed her ever so slightly. Then with more intensity as I took in her reaction. This long talked about, highly anticipated event was here and nothing felt more natural. Her lips, soft and sensual, were inviting. We paused for a moment to give our minds and souls a chance to catch up, to be on par with wherever this was headed. After this break, she leaned in and started kissing me again. This time, we allowed some tone. It was surreal. I couldn't believe we were doing this. We slowly caressed each other's bodies, her white her full white breasts felt wonderful to the touch. We lay talking, our hearts beating, and each of us trying to probe, figuring out what this event had done to our souls, but more importantly, those hormone-ridden bodies. It was amazing to know that we could be open with each other. We had crossed an imaginary line, yet our relationship looked none the worse for the wear. So far, at least. I kissed and caressed her as she began the journey. This female-induced orgasm must have been awesome. There was a glow in her eyes and on her skin when she returned. She turned her full attention to me, almost as if realizing she had neglected me or had work to do. Earlier on, she had paused, yes, paused to ask, what would I want her to do for me? Mouth aghast, I thought, wow. No bloke had ever paused long enough to ask. <laughs> Did this a dream come true or what? <laughs> we fell into a snooze that lasted for a short period. Too short to allow sweet dreams. I was jolted back to reality by the sound of an alarm clock going off. It was time to get ready. We had decided to attend evening mass. <laughs> <laughs> Ironic? Perhaps. No one said anything about churchgoers not being human, right? We were Catholic. We were human. With the kiss, we had become by. We had become each other's first. Thank you. <laughs> and she looked over, she's like, you're not ready. <laughs> so cute. Okay. Um, so this piece is called Drowning. My jaw is open stonework. My throat is a well. There is a darkness down there that can swallow you. My tongue holds the stories down, buries them somewhere deep inside of myself. Pull up the rope. Unearth the bucket. See what story comes up. I am six years old. I'm meeting the mayor on a school trip. He smiles at me, white, shiny teeth. The only thing dark about him is his suit. My colors are smaller. I have brown skin, long, dark hair, and ancestry I run my fingers through in class. My dress is red, white, and green. Flag colors, a culture I can twirl in. He asks me where I got my beautiful Italian dress. Whenever I tell him that I got it in Mexico, he becomes more aware of my colors. His smile falters. A casual step back of someone about to trip over their own assumptions. 
he tells me that I don't look dark enough for that. It appears I'm only brown in a certain context, a silhouette against a landscape where all I can be is a shadow. This is the first time I remember not being seen. The first time I felt like coffee only tasted good if you blend it with cream. The brown in me is bitter, so it makes it more comfortable to only taste the white. This is the first time that my dress felt heavy, and my people know what carrying weight feels like. When I stop wearing that dress, I tell myself that it was too big anyway, large enough for my heritage to hide it. The well overflows sometimes. The bucket is too heavy. I'm always carrying this with me. My hands have callous from rope burns. But some stories have to be told. I am 14 years old. I am waiting in a doctor's office. A white woman smiles at me, notices my last name. She asks me if I had to take English classes. I say no. She praises me on speaking English so well, how happy it makes her that my people learn English because it shows that we want to be real Americans. I lean back in my chair and I think, I do speak English well. It's my first language, and you know that whatever you learn first is the thing that stays the longest. Here's what I've learned. I learned about my grandfather, who came to America with a, scar with a scarred body and calloused hands who gave gifts to a nation who told him that Mexicans belong in the dirt since the shade of his skin is so similar to it. White women were not so different. I learned about the pilgrims. We're all immigrants. White woman, I understand why you think that I am different from you. I know how brown can seem so different from white. My two sides are constantly at war. My identity is the terrain we wage over. My heritage is brown and white, and they mix into a color I can't name. But I am no more an American than you are. We are all immigrants. My people know what it feels like to be cut by barbed wire, to bleed from paper cuts from citizenship, the same way your people know what seasickness feels like. <laughs> the fences could tell you about the tears my people leave behind. We make rivers in a desert. Ellis Island can tell you about the backaches your people get from carrying the burden of American expectations. <coughs> and she compliments me again on my skill at learning English and how much of a real American I am. And I say to her, my English is good, but my Navajo needs work. I'm trying to be a real American, you know? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, that works. <laughs> I'm not going to ask, I'm just going to be grateful. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, I had, I've had a really bad cold for like a week and my nose has been bleeding. I'm so sorry. Um, my hands blister. My arms ache. But some burdens you don't choose to carry, some are chained to you. And I have no choice but to drag them with me. I'm 16 years old. I'm sitting in the cafeteria. A white boy reads my name off of my ID and mispronounces it. When I correct him, he tells me that I should change Martinez to Martin because it's easier for him to say. And, I'm like, and I think that my name is not just a name, it's a heritage. My grandfather's hands didn't callous for me to soften them with Americanized accents. My father's brown hands were not discolored by whiteness when he signed my name on a birth certificate. Words have power. Whenever someone speaks, the syllables carry weight. This boy's mouth did not know what Spanish tastes like. He is allowed to mispronounce its flavors. But when he tells me that I should change my last name, I won't mention all of the sacrifices that my people have made to accommodate his voice. I won't mention the paper cuts of immigration that scar the hands of my people, the words we only whisper out of hearing a white voice raise. I only tell him about my grandfather's hands, how soft his voice was. My grandfather made music. He could play the sweetest sounds, make orchestras with just his hands and his heart, could make sheet music flow off the page and into your soul. I trust that my last name sounded beautiful enough for him. The brown symphonies in me won't be drowned out by the white noise you've grown accustomed to. 
because some nights, white noise is all I hear, echoing in my ears, and I need those symphonies more than ever. Oh, here we go. The girls were like, you have a memoir? <laughs> well, not on the shelf yet. It's called Welcome to America. Paging Sheila and Melody and Yume, 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 Yume Yumiki. Your plane is departing. Please proceed to gate B23 immediately. The voice over the PA system was so cold and impersonal. I'd heard that's how people were in this land of milk and honey. I doubled my steps and broke into a run, dragging my hand luggage behind me and trying to get my sister to keep up. At 15, she hadn't wanted to move to the U.S., but at this point in the travel game, it was a bit too late not to leave Ghana. We were one plane ride away from our new home in Columbus, Ohio. We rushed past, two, we rushed past rows of passengers awaiting their own boarding calls, whiling away their layovers. Are you Sheila and Melody? A uniformed white lady interrupted our heavy panting as we came careening around yet another bend in Detroit's John Wayne Airport. Yes, I nodded. I was pushing my body as hard as it could go, I gushed. It's okay, I can see that. I radiated the tower. We were just told you were arriving in the U.S. for the first time and were delayed in immigration. And the lady explained. Did we miss our flight to Columbus? My sister interrupted her. No, hon, we're holding the plane for you, she said as she patted my sister's reddish brown curl. <coughs> Do we still have to run, she asked again. No, you're almost at the gate, she said, and gestured as the gate came into view around the bend. The gate agent rushed to meet us to escort us onto the plane. As we neared the walkway, I gasped. The plane was sitting a considerable distance away from the connecting jet bridge. A small plank came into view as we reached the edge. Do you want to see Ma and everyone else? I asked Sheila as she halted before the plank and refused to budge. Okay. We jumped. Welcome to America! Auntie Vicky exclaimed as she came towards Sheila and I, arms outstretched with a long winter coat tucked under each arm. She embraced us. She was our host family. Finally, we are here, Ma added. Finally, you are here, Ma added, as she adjusted an identical coat under her arm. We hadn't seen them in almost a year, and we hadn't lived with her in 14. What about you? What about me? Do I get a hug too? I looked down to see my youngest sister, her big round eyes shaded by bushy eyebrows and thick, thick lashes staring up at me. I leaned down and pretended to pick her up, saying how big she had gotten since I last saw her when she visited Ghana the year before. My mother had gotten remarried well in Liberia and moved to the U.S. with her dad. The relationship hadn't lasted very long, but Ma had gotten custody and was raising Jawan with the help from the host family. These two women had taken my mother, a total stranger, in when, when my sister's father got abusive. How was the food on the flight? She asked excitedly, recalling her first flight to Ghana the year before. Girl, they fed us these strange things. They looked like wraps, and they had beans and meat. Cheese, yes, cheese and rice. Oh, burritos! Oh, that's what they call them? Okay. We almost missed the connecting flight from Detroit, my sister said. Ma, they radioed ahead to the cockpit and told them we were on our way because we were arriving in the U.S. for the first time, I chimed in. I bet you girls are starving. Your mother and I decided to take you out to Olive Garden to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> Here, put these on, Ma said. They handed us the coats, which were long and gray and almost down to our ankles. As I would later learn, all fashion sense went out the door when it came to the brutal winters in the Midwest. <laughs> the coats just had to keep you warm.
<laughs> they also handed us boots to change into. We have had one of our worst winters yet. All the trees on our street have lost branches because they've been so weighed down by the snow massive. And to Vicky chatted away as she held us into her coats, handed us hats and earmuffs, and finally produced two bulky pairs of gloves that looked like they belonged in the boxing ring. <laughs> I started to think what this winter thing could be all about. <laughs> <laughs> Off we go, she said, laughing at my bemused look. She grabbed a hold of our carry-on luggage and led the way. That night, at Olive Garden, I discovered pasta. <laughs> <laughs> and my ambivalence about red sauce. <laughs> Welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? Ah, bye! Dokun! Oh, I'm so sick of Ghanaian food, Sheila said, as Ma asked if she should warm up some kinky for our dinner. Ma shot Sheila a look that should have stopped her in her tracks. Unperturbed, Sheila continued, I thought you promised us McDonald's for dinner. We are in America now. We shall eat American fruit. I was convinced she would receive a slap or a severe ground. But Mar looked at her and smiled. Was she condoning rudeness? Apologetically, Ma said, I know how you feel. I was just like you that first month. I couldn't get enough. Take it from me. You will soon grow sick of it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see about that, I thought. Okay, so Ma, until we get sick of it, can we get fast food? <laughs> Sheila threw me a look of gratitude as I sealed the deal. Knowing we had won, Sheila asked if there was anything we needed to do before we left to buy Mickey D's. <laughs> sure, Ma said, taking advantage of her pliant teens. Laundry all folded and neatly stowed, my two sisters and I piled ourselves into Ma's 1987 champagne-colored Toyota Tercel and headed to the McDonald's in Columbus's bustling Whitehall neighborhood on Broad Street, which was about a 25-minute drive from our apartment. Broad Street has the best cluster of shopping malls and food entries. Ma said it was because that was where mostly white people lived. Even the Target and the New York Company, which soon became my favorite clothing store, had better clothing selection on that side of the street. On that, sorry, had better clothing selection than those on the east side, a block from where we lived. This was my first entry point into some of the finer subtleties of race in the U.S. The Mikadiz we went to was a large one, and it had an outdoor place, play place attached to it. What shall it be for the young ladies today, they would ask each of us in turn as we crowded around Ma at the counter. I always ordered the same thing. A Big Mac, no pickles please, no mustard, medium fries, and a Coke. Thank you. <laughs> the person at the counter would smile or grunt, depending on their disposition. Because my mother was a hospice nurse and worked just up the street from Whitehall, she often stopped there on her way home to pick us up a meal or a snack. Some of the regular workers knew her and knew her children were coming from Ghana, so they were excited to meet us finally. Sometimes they would comment on our unique accents and proceed to ask us about it. At 15 and 19, fresh off the boat, Sheila and I never cared much for sharing such distinguishing details about ourselves. Attempting to recreate ourselves, the last thing we needed were those darn unique accents. <laughs> Some days we'd play a game and make up states to match the accent. Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> Minnesota. <laughs> These trips became routine almost weekly on the days when Ma had the whole day off. There was probably something about not cooking this food ourselves that also enticed us. Our house our housekeepers, Ajoa and Auntie Mercy, were no longer churning out our meals, and I realized that what they did was no easy feat. As the eldest girl, and with a mother who worked two jobs, I became the house girl in no time. Never mind that I didn't have to light a coal pot, and I had a white electric stove at my disposal each time I had to prepare meals. My understanding of America was that it was a relatively easy place to live. Why go through the four hour long process of making a stew for a family of four when we could just as easily order pizza? 
<laughs> and so the tradition continued. Taco Bell one week, Pizza Hut the next, as we discovered the many enticing fast food options. Until, like Ma said, we grew tired of it and began to long for the food from home. One afternoon, I came from my part-time job and three classes feeling for kinky. Kinky is, is um, like polenta. Luckily for me, Ma had continued to shop at the Ghanaian grocery store, even as we temporarily hated Ghanaian food. I knew exactly where to find it. I removed one from the fridge and decided to use the microwave instead of boiling it on the stove. After all, they say it's faster. It had been about six weeks since we had arrived, and Auntie Vicky had showed us how to use it. However, neither she nor Ma told us which materials were now allowed in there. <laughs> I wrapped the kinky in a clean dish towel and popped it into the microwave. Hit four minutes on the high and left to change my clothes. Kinky is made from cornmeal. It is ground and soaked for about four days to allow fermentation to take place. And then it's made into a porridge and then they're balled up and then boiled. So it's a very long process. So most of us just now just buy it and then freeze it and boil it when you need it. So obviously this has been frozen and it's now being thawed. And, you know. A portion, as I reached my bedroom door, I heard sparks and hardly returned to the kitchen. The foil had caught fire and was dancing on the spinning glass plate. Oh my God. I panicked recalling stories of electrocution that grandmother had told us to discourage us from nagging her about getting an electric stove. <laughs> I made sure I had rubber on and my hands were completely dry and I had shoes on. There was a final explosion as I stood there and then everything went dark in the kitchen. <laughs> it must have blown a fuse. Lucky for me, the microwave didn't get ruined, just blackened. I cleaned it out best I could boiled the parts of the kinky that survived the fiasco, <laughs> ate frosted flakes for dinner, and watched Nick at night. <laughs> While I waited for the rest of the family to come home and advise me, advise me on how to fix the fuse. Those first few months in the U.S. were an adventure. We were introduced to 24-7 television, and we discovered all the packaged foods that had never been part of our lives before. You ain't American. Ma! Ma! Anybody home? Where, where do you think they went? I asked my sister, who shrugged and just ran upstairs to her room. Before I turned the corner to the kitchen, I was sobbing uncontrollably. I burst into the kitchen. I was expecting my mother's worried face. The hiccups set in. By the time everyone arrived with dinner, I could barely speak for the number of hiccups I had per second. I glanced around and saw the note hurriedly written on the whiteboard on the fridge. Went to get chicken wings and pizza from Pizza Hut to celebrate you making President's List. Well done. Page me if you have any special requests. Love, Mom. I began a full-blown ball out session after reading this note. I don't want pizza. I want fufu. I want cake cake. I yelled to the empty room. I furiously wiped my eyes. Of all the days for Ma to get fast food, American food belonged to American people. Today, I was told I was not American. Go back to your country, they yelled at me as the driver revved the engine and squealed the tires until they came to a screeching halt inches away from us. Unkempt hair, khaki-colored clothes, white men stared at Sheila and I as we were crossing the side street walking to get our afternoon milkshakes from Burger King. The white 93 Mazda came out of nowhere. Sheila and I had done the usual routine of looking both ways, then looking a third time. I had a sense they sped up in the parking lot when they finally saw us crossing. All you niggas need to leave America as American. You ain't American. America ain't yarn. I should have fucking run you over. The driver leaned out his window and yelled. The veins in his neck and on his scalp popped as he yelled. There was a white boy for each orifice of the car, including the fun group. <laughs> the others all yelled out different racial slurs. One kept chanting, go back, go back. They peeled off after what seemed like five minutes of yelling. 
I was mortified. Such awful use of the English language. <laughs> when I recovered from my grammatical hell, I began my own barrage of comments a little too late. Sheila dragged me away, petrified that we would endanger our lives if we stayed out much longer. America doesn't belong to anyone. Hell, it doesn't even belong to your ancestors. And how dare they call me the N-word? My ancestors were never brought over on slave ships. I stuttered in indignation. Afraid of drawing more attention to herself, Sheila encouraged me to stop talking and head home. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, it seemed all the restaurant patrons were white. Not one had made mention of the incident that had just transpired outside, although I'm sure they had all been privy to it. They just kept their eyes on their burgers and fries. I was disgusted. Sheila and I were silent as we walked home. I yelled out again to the empty room, this time in my mother's native tongue. No more milkshakes for me, or burgers, or pizzas. They were representative of American food. I was not American. I was done pretending. Sheila had left to her room unsure of what to do with me. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate having a full room. We've been working really hard and just with the seven of us, so it's nice to have other people nod and snap and you know, tap. So we know we're doing something right. <laughs> Thank you. If you need to talk to any of us, I'm sure we'd be happy to chat. Right? <laughs> 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 you can uh, come up here so that we don't obstruct movement of people trying to get out. Thank you so much.